where the relationship broke between Francis and the U- Francis and his team and the UFC, okay, is all right, Jesse on fire. Welcome back. So we're going to talk about the Francis and Ganu situation again because, well, a couple of reasons. I watched a video yesterday that was absolutely comprehensive, covered the entire situation, and I'm talking, we're talking like from three years ago, every single detail that happened from when John Jones won against Dominic Reyes and they started talking about him moving up to fight Francis all the way to two seconds ago about Francis. And and listen, anybody who watches my content consistently knows I've had a very inside track on this particular topic. I've been telling you, oh, like this is going on six months before, you know, it was public information and, you know, and I learned a ton of stuff from this video. So I'm going to show you that. And then today, I watched a video that Chael did about Hamza Shemaev and he just kind of casually dropped this thing about Francis that was like, my brain went, and listen, I mean, if if I get, if I get caught off guard by a thing and and really think about it, I'm like, wow, dude, if that's, if that's not something I'm going to share on my channel, then, you know, what am I doing here? Because I want you guys to go on a thought exercise with me when I explain what Chael said and really think it through and think about what the potential would have been had Francis done what Chael laid out. And that's also interesting because obviously as the Francis thing has unfolded, I think it's fair to say that like uh, lots of people have felt as though Chael has been, uh, I don't know, what's what's the right way to say it? Like the impression was that Chael was uh, like very critical of what Francis was doing, only had one way that he thought that this should go. You know whether that's true or not. I mean, I don't know, but that, like that certainly has been what I've read in the comments, and you know from from other people that's kind of been the impression that they've given. But man, that the I I can't I, I can't exaggerate how 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 big this would have been if if Francis would have done the thing that Chael laid out today. So that's what we're going to talk about. So go ahead and subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Also, let's talk about sheath underwear really quick because we have a winner on the jays that's it we got a winner on the jays for last month and there's a big surprise dude a big surprise on who it is i'm going to show you who it is right now because you know what it's a girl it's a girl and not a bad looking girl either not a bad looking girl at all that's who won okay that's who won trig nasty she is the winner of the jays this month uh, maybe we'll have her and her dude come on and they can, uh, you know, show the Jays when, uh, when they get them. Also, uh, for this month, like, listen, Sheath has the best products in the world. They have the best shirts in the world. They're the best, they're the best brand in the world. All the best channels are sponsored by Sheath. If you want to get on the train, all you have to do is go to sheathunderwear.com for, uh, no, no for itself. Sheathunderwear.com Buy anything on the website. Use the promo code fire F I R E send the uh the receipt to real jesse on fire at gmail and you'll be entered to win the jays this month why do i do i pay for these jays myself this is not like sheath doesn't do it i do it because i love sheath that much they are an incredible sponsor and i want to support the ongoing sponsorship with sheath and i want to give you guys the opportunity to get something out of supporting the channel through the uh you know, sponsorships that I do. So, uh, sheathunderwear.com, buy anything on the website, uh, send the receipt to real Jesse on fire at Gmail and you're entered to win them this month. All right. So here is where I, I'm going to start with Chael's thing. Okay. I want to talk about that. And then I want to show you guys some clips from this video right here, which is, uh, the people's history of John Jones versus France and It's an hour and 40 minutes long. Okay. So I want to like, I'll, I'll show you guys a little bit of it. And, uh, and then, I'll show you guys some really notable stuff from it too, like stuff that I learned that I didn't even know about how the UFC does business and where communication ended up being the breakdown of that entire relationship. All right, so here is what Chael said, all right? And so a little bit of context. Who would you guys say historically has been the best marketer of themselves in the history of the UFC? Like the best, like the best, uh, the best, like, I'm talking, like, not just, like, a person who's being themselves and people connect with them, you know, like Connor. Like, I, I think Connor is kind of outside of the conversation that we're going to have right now because Connor was just himself, right? Now, he, it's himself turned up to a 10, just like me on this channel, right? I'm not doing anything that's not me. I just kind of kick it up a notch when I'm, uh, when I'm recording videos. 
And like that's that's like that's what Connor was doing in the fight business. Chael, different ball game, right? Like Chael built out, I mean, it's him to attend, but he's playing a character. He's playing the bad guy. He's explained this a million times, you know, especially if you listen to him talk about his interactions with Vanderlei Silva on uh, on the Ultimate Fighter and where Vanderlei Silva wanted him to apologize and Chael was trying to explain to him. He's like, Vanderlei, you don't want me to apologize. I'm the bad guy, Okay. You are the good guy. Just play your role. Just be the good guy. I'm trying to make the fans not like me. You don't want them to like me. They want you want them to like you. I'm like I'm not apologizing and you should be supportive of this, right? And you know, you just think about other things that he did and there's like obviously he's playing a character. He goes to New York. He wins a, you know, he uh he wins a fight. They give him the microphone and the first thing he's like god I hate New York. I mean, it's like it's it's not rocket science what he's doing. Super clever, incredible one-liners. He's the best, right? So if he says a thing related to how a fighter should market themselves, you should sit down and listen, right? And when it comes to Francis, obviously, I don't know, whatever. People have have, have the impression that he was being biased, but in this case, this particular... I mean, he's made a lot of good points throughout the thing too. But in this, this instance, again, my brain went like this boom because i could just instantly visualize what he said and i was like my goodness gracious that would have been one of the greatest the single greatest strategic plays ever and so what he said is he said i think francis should have never once spoken publicly and he's just dead silent and he's like just think about the mystique that would have lived around francis Ngannou if no fans ever heard him talk even once and i thought about that and i was like holy shit dude that would have been the most gangster ass thing of all time dude like really think about it really think about what francis looks like think about what it would look like where this guy comes in they oh they stick it they stick a microphone they try to interview him and they're like we could never get this guy to talk he's a complete mystery all you know is that he comes from africa right there are rumors that he even speaks English, but he just refuses to speak in public. You could never find any footage of him speaking on camera, and he would just come in dead silent, mean mug on, decapitate his opponent in 25 seconds, bounce. Dude, he would have been probably the biggest star. I think, honestly, I think he might have been the biggest star in the history of the sport that's not named Conor McGregor. And it's not like everyone could do that, but Francis could have done that, dude. If Francis just never said a single word, okay? And that's not a knock on Francis talking, right? Like, I mean, we've, we've talked about this. Like, it's not like he, uh, you know, he doesn't have the gift on camera or the gift on the microphone that some people do, obviously. But he has the, the his, he is overflowing with the gifts in these other departments, right? Like when it comes to, when it comes to, how he looks, how he fights, every other thing, the way he carries it, dude. Like if he would have, <laughs> God, dude, my, every, every, like I'm just, cause I'm just visualizing this. Like he could have come out, you know, he could have done it kind of Tyson where he just comes out shirt off, where he doesn't even look like he's playing a character. He just refuses to talk. I think that's actually probably best. Or he could have done a thing where he comes out, sunglasses, looks like an African warlord. And he just never talks. Like absolutely never talks he could do a thing make a gimmick out of it where he would stand there you know not every time but he stands there and rogan would go my goodness francis and i gotta be honest i don't even know do do you need a translator or what are we doing here like do we need a translator or 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 can you talk to us and he'd just go boop and francis would just look at him and just not say a single thing and keep a straight face and then and then just bounce dude and people would be like what the fuck no one's ever done that before and it wouldn't work for most people you know like it would have to be a very specific per it would have to be francis like it wouldn't work for anyone else but it, it, it would absolutely work for francis that would have been man man i mean in all honesty if we're being straight like it's it's hard to say you know it's hard to like know what a guy is going to be you know early enough to do that gimmick because of course like the 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 formula is fight interview all that but like 
good God, man. If you would have had a, if you would have had a, had a crystal ball and known what Francis's career was going to be like, which we've gone over plenty of times and we can, you know, for those who seem to, you know, like people, I, I, no one in the history of the UFC, I think has a more confused fan base about their, like their record in fighting. Cause for whatever reason, people just like, they're all, Oh, he got blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, all right, well, here you go. So forget about the Cyril gone fight because he had a torn MCL, but Stipe second round knockout 52 seconds in after he would have won by knockout in the first, uh, Rosen streak, 20 second knockout, uh, journey dos Santos lasted over a minute. Look at that, dude. Wow. Good job. You know, uh, one minute and 11 seconds, Kane Velasquez, 26 seconds knockout F Curtis blades, 45 second knockout. Okay, so three guys, all top five fighters at the time. Well, Kane was coming back, but like it's Kane Velasquez. Those three guys lasted a combined uh, less than two and a half minutes. Okay, less than two and a half minutes for these guys. That is, wait a minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Four guys, two and a half minutes in 20 seconds. So that's 46 seconds plus uh, 45 seconds. So that's a minute and a half plus. Uh, Wow, four guys in under three minutes. Four guys. Let me just let me just make sure that we let me. Like, uh, I feel like let's just make sure that we get that across. Four guys. Okay, going into his into his title fight. Four guys, all top contenders or former potential heavyweight goat coming back off of the thing. Right. Curtis Blades, who was just in a title, you know, in a, in a title eliminator. Junior Dos Santos, who, who was always at the top of the division while he was there. Kane Vela Kane Velasquez and Rosenstreak, who was undefeated at the time, ten and zero. And Francis knocked all four of those guys out in less than three combined minutes. Think about that, dude. Think about that. Four top contenders in less than three minutes. Starched, starched, starched. All of them. Cain Velasquez, he knocked him out so hard that like people didn't even believe it. They were like, what happened? I think Cain's knee folded in half. It's all his knee folded in half because Francis hit him with a shot like this. Boop. He literally went boop, boop. People couldn't even see it. And his knee folded. Okay. And that's after, that's after he lost to Stipe. Forget about the Derek Lewis fight. That was some kind of weird, freaky thing that I don't even know. That was a, that was like a mental thing. And you go before that, right? Here's what was going on but going into his initial title fight. Okay, just UFC, second round knockout, you know, second round knockout, and then he hits his stride, first round knockout, minute and a half, first round knockout, less than two minutes, first round knockout, minute and a th minute 30, first round knockout, knockout, minute 42, decapitation, okay? Like, I don't think people, I think, that, again, I, I've never understood how there was this big gap between the reality of Francis's career and how people have interpreted it. It's like anybody that's not, like Stipe, first fight, Sure, he wrestle fucked him, hundred percent. And then Derek Lewis, Francis had never lost like that before. He came in kind of gun shy and just that was just weird. Like that was like a mental block fight, hundred percent. Okay, take that out of the equation. And anyone who got out of the first round with Francis did something special. Like got out of the first minute, did something special. Almost no one got past two minutes with this guy. Almost no one got past two minutes with this guy. Okay. If he would have been quiet through all of that, dude, just think about it. If he would have never talked, if he wouldn't have talked at all through that entire thing, just think about the, what, it would, what that would have been like. Man. And so when you consider that there's about to be this huge announcement coming very soon, at least that's the rumor uh, around the mill, that this is, uh, you know, the rumor is that th there's a big announcement coming. I saw that on Jail's channel too about six days ago and the rumor is uh is that the announcement's going to be big right so i mean i think we all know what is probably going to be but uh yeah but anyway so the other side of this thing i wanted to show you guys this right so this is the video that i watched yesterday i can't stress how good this video was and i don't understand where the, this guy like this guy did such incredible research and only only 5,200 people have watched it so far. Or actually, it's only got 5,200 views. So you're probably talking like, I don't know, 4,700 people that have even watched it. Now, one part that I really thought, well, you know, I mean, like he goes through every single thing that happened in this saga. And, okay, so, oh, wait, hang on. 
So there's actually even a section about Chael here. At one um, about uh, yeah, 103, but that it's nothing super notable. But this part right so my here, critiques of their action, the Hunter Campbell part is incredibly informative. Okay, so he talks about who who Hunter is and all, and all this stuff. I'm trying. To, I just want to make sure that I don't because like it's not like and ultimately don't explain everything. That is because the real person at fault is one man, in my opinion, chief business officer of the UFC and likely heir to Dana's throne at the head of the UFC, Hunter Campbell. So who is Hunter Campbell? Campbell is a lawyer that was brought in by Endeavor when they first bought a majority stake in the UFC back in 2016. Okay, I'm not going to make you listen to this whole thing because, you know, if you're listening, if you're used to the pace that I bring, this is going to sound like this is a more like this is not the kind of video that I do. It's fantastic, though. I want to tell you guys what his point is, though, because it is very, very notable and very interesting. Okay, so here is what his his point is. Okay, so the where the relationship broke between Francis and the U, Francis and his team and the UFC. Okay, is Francis was asked if he could fight in June. All right. Now he had. This is after he won. Steep. He was the. He was the champion. He had just won it in March. Okay. He had just won it in March. They asked if he could fight in June. Two months later. Now, obviously, everyone has to understand that at this point, France has one fight left on his deal. He has a sunset clause. Eighteen months later, and also uh, he has the champ clause. Also, right. So even if. So either way, if he fights the last fight on his contract and he's the champion. Then he's got 18 months uh, for them to resign. If he loses the last fight on his contract, he doesn't have the champ clause. He immediately becomes an unrestricted free agent. So there's this weird, you know, there's this weird thing going on where they're trying to resign him, but they realize, you know, they're probably looking at it and they're having to strategize. They're like, wait, what if we sign him and then he loses? He's an unrestricted free agent. They're trying to avoid that, right? And so they originally asked if he could fight in June and he can't. Okay, because he has a trip. He's in Africa. He's he's at home and he has a visa issue. He's trying to interact with the UFC, trying to get his visa redone. The UFC, for some reason, says they can't do it at that point. I don't even want to get into all of that because, you know, as it relates to this, it's it's only partially related. But Francis then agrees that he can do it in September. Okay, he just fought in March. He just fought in March. So as far as they know, as far as uh, Eric Nixick and Francis and all of them know, he's fighting again in September on September 5th. They even started a camp. All right. So they start training and inside the first week of him training, they announced the interim title fight in August. And so they were like, what the, uh, why? Right. Like, I don't understand. Now also they had offered Francis the August one and he said he couldn't do it. He said we could do it in September. So they originally offered June. Then they moved to August. He said he couldn't do it. He said they could do it in September. Okay. April, May, June, July, August. That's not, that's, it's only five months after he won the fight. Like that's, that's not unreasonable at all. Right. So they think that they're now fighting in September and technically they have moved it back 30 days from when they like really offered in the fight and it was reasonable. They can't just like, you know, Hey, can you fight again in two months and then impose a, an extension if he says no, given, given that he turned down a fight. So this requires a little bit of context also. So the UFC is required to offer fighters three fights per year, okay? Three fights per year. And if fighters turn down the fight, they get extended six months, okay? So the fighters get offered a fight and they don't have to take it, but if they turn it down, their contract gets extended six months or the UFC can elect to extend them six months, okay? So they offer the June fight and Francis can't do it in June. Then they go September. now. If you're smart and you understand that he only has one fight left on his deal, I'm sure the UFC knew he couldn't do it in June, right? And so they're looking for a way to extend him six months because he only has one fight left on his deal and they're trying to protect against him losing the fight and becoming an unrestricted free agent, okay? So then they're like, well, I don't think that we can impose a, an extension on him turning down a fight that's like seven weeks after he won. That's, you know, we're not going to be able to defend that. So let's give it to him in August. We know he has this visa issue. He's not going to be able to do that one either. Then when he turns that down, we'll be able to give him a six-month extension. So he turns that one down. He says he can do it in September. They implement a six-month extension on him. At the same time, they announce the fight that is going to be the interim fight between 
uh, Derek Lewis and Cyril Gaon. So to the the Francis side, they look like these guys are doing him dirty, right? Like they're to them, they're like the especially the fact that they're calling this an interim fight, right? Because normally they do an interim fight when they think that uh, you know when like like when the champion can't fight, and so they're like, "What's I don't understand? We're, we already said we would fight in September. Why are you why are you uh, why are you doing an interim fight, right?" Now. What is it revealed in this video, which is speculation, but incredibly, incredibly likely, is that what he thinks is that in the Endeavor deal, it is contractually obligated that the UFC puts a title on the line for every single pay-per-view, that there are no exceptions to that except if Endeavor approves it, like they did for the Conor McGregor fights. So they are required to have a title on the line for every single pay-per-view with no exceptions unless Endeavor agrees to the exception, which again, when Connor's the headliner, of course they're gonna do an exception. Exception. So the reality of the situation, as he puts it, is that they probably had to do the interim belt because they didn't have a title fight for that for that card. And what they were doing is essentially doing an interim belt to, to make the fight between Francis and the winner a much more hyped up fight. Either way, it's you know champion versus champion, right? And where they made the mistake is they didn't communicate this to Francis, right? They didn't communicate it to him. They sent him an extension. They did not communicate. The reason they were doing an interim fight was because of they were, because they were contractually required to have a title fight on that card. So this is speculation, but this made a lot of sense to me where I was like, okay, that makes perfect sense why they would have done an interim fight because to that, it's, it's all upside. Okay, they get to they get to close the loop on the contractual obligation of the pay per view and simultaneously build the fight for the Francis fight up even more when they do the fight. But since they sent the extension letter also and they didn't explain that to Francis, it makes this compounding impression that they're trying to fuck him with the extension and simultaneously fuck him by taking you know making an interim belt to put more pressure on him. When in reality, the interim belt was not about putting pressure on him, although it probably may have been also. But the UFC's in a tough position, dude. They only had one fight. He only has one fight left on his deal. And it is not a good thing when they lose fighters, especially not someone as valuable as Francis, who does, oh, he's not that valuable. Yes, he is, dude. There are not that many good heavyweights. Certainly not ones that are, you know, first round knockout machines who just finally won the title in incredibly impressive fashion. You know, losing him is not a good thing, right? So anyway, my point is this video and that's just this one, like what I just laid out is just this one little section. Like this whole thing, it lays out all these things from top to bottom. It's incredibly, incredibly valuable information if you're interested in how this actually played out. Who's at fault? Why Francis made the decisions that he did? Why the UFC was doing the things that they were doing? It's incredibly insightful. I would heavily, heavily, as a matter of fact, look at this. Bam, bam. He just earned my sub while we were on the video. What's up? So... Yeah, I, uh, I I will, again, triple sign off. Like, Chael's idea, brilliant. Uh, this video, brilliant. The video that I'm referencing here. And, uh, yeah, so tell all your friends. I, uh, I, I effed myself with the algorithm again. And now, at least this time, I definitely know how, okay? I would go through these random cycles. Like, I would get my channel, my, my views back up on par again. And then always, like, something would happen. And I would be like, what just happened, dude? I just lost 30% of my, like, just like that. My, like, just 30 And I could never figure it out. And now I have figured it out. 100%. It's when I do long live streams, not around, like, the, the events. And I leave them up. I should have listened to Guru a long time ago. He was like, I don't ever leave my, my live streams up. And I just was like, oh, I think because YouTube shows me you know, oh, here's your average views on your on your on your videos, and here's your average views on your live streams. I if I do back to back live streams without a video in between, then it starts referencing those two videos or those the, the live streams, and it translates to how much they're going to suggest my content to other people. Like if you have two bad videos in a row, or not bad, but just like that aren't clicked on very much, then it tells you to, you know it tells the algorithm like this is how interested people are in your content. But like they're two hours long, of course people aren't going to click on them as much. So I will never make that mistake again, but if you could help me get out of the doghouse with the algorithm and share this with your friends, that would be incredibly helpful because it's infuriating. I did this to myself. I do it all the time. I'm never making this mistake again. From now on, I'm doing live streams. They're immediately coming down and then I'm gonna put them on my second channel. That is what's happening from now on. I will never leave another live stream up. That is what it is. So anyway, uh, love you guys.
Tell your friends. Uh, share the video. Peace.